as we begin this season of Lent. We turn to Luke's account of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, just after his baptism and just prior to the launch of his public ministry. We're reading from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 1 to 13. I invite you to listen for God's living word. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, feed us, fill us, use us. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds, this day, that we may receive the word you have for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Notice how Lent begins. From Jesus dripping into, dipping into the water of the Jordan and dripping when he comes out, one minute, to wandering in the dry desert in the very next from blissfully floating in the river of God's favor to being swiftly marched into the desert, from being named as God's beloved to being tested by the devil. Jesus hardly has time to reach for a towel or to lace up his sandals before the Spirit picks him up out of the water and drops him off out there all alone in the middle of nowhere. The shift is quick. The change in direction and drama is jarring, perhaps not unlike the scene we will encounter some weeks down our Lenten road when the crowds will shout, Hosanna, in one breath, and crucify him in the next. And yet, this wild ride, this roller coaster contrast between delight and the devil is not completely unlike our own life experience. High peaks followed by deep valleys, feasts interrupted by famine, or conversely, a trudge through rough country before we are able to rise up enough to catch a glimpse of the promised land. While we are more likely to find ourselves in the wilderness by the inevitably challenging circumstances of life than by the Spirit's leading, the chances are that sooner or later we all find ourselves wandering out there in the wilderness. Maybe your wilderness 
is the long struggle of a serious illness, your own or someone's you love. Maybe it's the heavy gray cloud of a depression that won't lift, or the confusion of dementia. Maybe it's a seemingly interminable season of unemployment, the ending of a significant relationship, the dry well of grief after a death, or the kind of loneliness that sits like a heavy bag of sand right in the middle of your chest. Every week in this place, there are 10 different 12-step groups who meet in our classrooms, every one of them packed with people who have experienced the wasteland of addiction. And then there's the anger, the futility, the sense of powerlessness we experience as we take in the steady stream of shocking news from the public square and the gun violence that plagues us as a country and keeps killing our children. Our current landscape seems to be a kind of desert too, dry and desolate. There is a wilderness of bad news. At best then, our time in the wilderness seems to be a trial of endurance. At worst, it's a test of survival. And the Bible is full of such stories. There's Noah as he watches the waters rise for 40 days and flood his world. And Elijah as he ducks for cover and fearfully flees the wrath of Jezebel for 40 days. And the ancient Hebrew people, as they wander around lost for 40 years, with no food, no water, and no sense of direction or purpose. And then there's Jesus. He's been fasting for 40 days, and he's famished. In another version of this same story in the Gospels, Jesus has wild beasts to contend with in addition to the devil tormenting him with temptations all of which might lead us to believe that the wilderness is a place to be avoided under all circumstances. And yet, if you read a little further, you discover that it's in the wilderness that person after person and an entire nation of people find God. In Noah's story, God makes an everlasting covenant with the earth with a rainbow as its promise. In Elijah's, God's reassurance comes to him finally in the quiet as a whisper, in the sound of sheer silence. For Israel, during all those years while they are wandering around in the desert, God shows up to guide them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God gives them manna every morning to nourish and sustain them, and God makes the commandments which form them as a community. For Jesus, the Gospels tell us that it was God's Spirit that led him out into the rough country. It's on the basis of all these stories and by the power of that same spirit that ever since the fourth century, the church has annually set aside the season of Lent to extend an invitation to us to enter the wilderness, to willingly walk right into it, to follow Jesus there and to enter our own 40-day pilgrimage of reflection, repentance, and renewal. Why on earth would we want to do that? Because the story our faith tells us over and over again is that what at first seems to be like a wasteland might indeed be holy and fertile ground. And the times when we feel the most lost might also be the occasions when we are most likely to let ourselves be found by God. It's not just when we are strong, but when we are weak, 
when we admit what we don't know, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, that we may find the greatest opportunity to grow in faith, to grow as people. My friend Mary Ludy puts this in a way that I love and I want to cultivate and live. The heart that is not shocked by its own mistakes is a God magnet she says. Not a heart wallowing in guilt, mind you. Not a perpetually self-abasing or gloomily self-loathing heart. Just a heart that isn't shocked by its own mistakes, but assumes them as a baseline human fact. A heart that in a mysterious way of speaking welcomes frailty as a God magnet. And so is accompanied intimately, by the mercy within mercy, inside mercy, who is God. I'm not sure I always know what she means by this, except that the first time I heard her say such a thing, I started to weep. And it's so beautiful. I know it must be true. The word Lent comes from an old English word that refers to the lengthening of days and the arrival of spring. But as Barbara Brown Taylor notes, this isn't just a reference to the crocuses pushing their way out of the ground in the season before Easter. It's also about the greening of the human soul, pruned with repentance, fertilized with fasting, spritzed with self-appraisal, mulched with prayer. Traditionally, Lent is the time when we purposely give our faith permission to work on us. And the invitation this season includes the understanding that the wilderness might be the place where we discover who we really are and what our lives are really about. The experience of Jesus can be our guide. In Luke's telling of the story, the devil confronts Jesus with three temptations. The first one seems to be about comfort, turning stones into bread, as if the devil purrs, look, you and I both know you are dreadfully hungry. Why not make some bread? You know you can do it. Take it and eat. On a deeper level, however, the temptation boils down to this. You can do this all on your own. You don't need God's spirit to sustain you. In a similar way, the second temptation also seems to be about power. All these kingdoms can be yours, and surely you'd be a better ruler than Rome is. And the third one, about glory. Throw yourself down, and let's watch God rescue you. It's true that these particular temptations are not exactly ones you and I are likely to encounter in our lifetimes. When it's our turn, we're not likely to get the Son of God tests. Except that embedded in all three of them is the one with which I imagine we are all well acquainted. It's the temptation to doubt the truth of who you are. It's the temptation to believe that the voice from heaven and your name, beloved, is a lie. That it's not true, or not enough, or that it doesn't last, or that it can be taken away, or that it has to be earned and re-earned over a lifetime. Or as someone else perhaps put it better, there is a sure way to identify the devil's voice. It always plays to our fears. It is the voice that tells us we must do something to prove who we are, to prove that we're worthy, to prove that we are who God has already declared us to be. Do you understand that your life belongs to God and that God loves you? 
And if you do, what does that mean for how you live it? These, I think, are the questions Jesus is grappling with in the wilderness. They're also the ones that all of us are invited to reflect on during the season of Lent. We know that in the end, Jesus doesn't give in to any of the temptations of the devil. Every time Jesus is offered bribes, bread, power, protection, he turns the devil down. No to the bread, no to the kingdoms, no to the angelic bodyguards. He says no to all these things because he has said yes to God. He is so filled up with God, with worshiping and serving God only, that he has no appetite for devilish idols or bribes. And after 40 days, he finds that he is centered in a life much greater than his own, rooted in a sustenance and power and trust much different than the ones the world understands. We can never really know, of course, why Jesus was sent into the wilderness, but we can see the good that it did in him. As his ministry unfolds, we can see how it freed him, how it freed him from all the devilish attempts to distract him from his true purpose, from any hunger or craving for things that would not give him or anyone else life. During his 40 days in the desert, Jesus acquires a kind of clarity he could not have found anywhere else. And he learns to trust that the spirit who has led him there will lead him out again. The season of Lent is upon us again with its invitation to go into the wilderness with Jesus to join him on a 40-day pilgrimage to contemplate who we are and what our lives are really about. Where will your Lenten journey take you? What does your wilderness look like? I once heard someone ask, which devils have your number and what kind of bribes do they use to get you to pick up? It's an interesting question, or at least an entertaining one. Maybe this season of Lent is an opportunity to answer it, to discover more clarity about your life, and to ask God to free you of the appetite for the things you know cannot and will never give you life. Still, the greatest invitation this season carries is the one Jesus discovered, to learn to trust the spirit who led you into the wilderness will also lead you out, and that the mercy within mercy, inside mercy, who is God, will accompany you always. Amen.